Let's take our Bibles this morning and open up with me, if you will, uh, to the book of Jonah. We still continue there this morning and put a marker here, if you would. The book of Jonah, chapter 1. As you're turning to Jonah, chapter 1, usually on a Sunday morning, about 7 to 7.30, I'm talking with a couple of different pastors, and we're just chatting back and forth through text messaging, and uh, one of them is Brother Carl Adamson, Jr., and if you will, keep him in prayer. He was to have had his other knee replaced this past week due to, uh, that's considered elective surgery. Yeah, not necessary, just elective. You just chose today to wake up and go get your knee replaced. Uh, So they've put him off until February the 17th. He is in a lot of pain. And so if you would keep him in prayer as he's standing in the pulpit today preaching. Also, uh, Peggy is having problems with her knees as well. She's bone on bone and they need to get her knees replaced as well. So I know they would really appreciate our prayers today, and uh, we'll just see how the Lord works in their lives and gets things moving for them. Imagine, if you will, that you're at a wedding reception, and whoever is in charge of uh, the wedding reception itself tries to get everybody's attention, and they can use a variety of means. They will get on the microphone, they would say you know, something like, ladies and gentlemen, can we have your attention, please? And that always works, right? And everybody just keeps chattering away. And then maybe they will take the microphone and they'll pat the microphone. Oh, don't do that. But they'll do that to see if that'll wake everybody up. And that doesn't work, so somebody has got a loud whistler. And so they'll look at that person. That person you know, lets one of those ear-piercing whistles rip. And that tends to work pretty well. Uh, maybe if that doesn't work, you take the microphone and you just put it in front of a speaker and make it squeal. And that really shuts everybody down real quick. Later on during the reception, there's going to be another time where you want to get everybody's attention. What does it mean when they take their silverware and what are they wanting? They want to smooch, not the person that's knocking, but you know, they want the bride and the groom to smooch. And so they will start banging their silverware on the table. And if I was the bride and the groom, I would think it gets a little irritating because some people get carried away with it. You can't take a bite of food and they start banging the table again. And maybe you say, oh, we found our way around that. We're just having a simple reception. We're not having the metal utensils. It's all going to be plastic. We're going to escape that nasty tradition. Oh, no, you won't. People will find something to bang on the table to get the attention of the bride and groom so that they will be forced into that situation. When somebody wants to get your attention, they will find all sorts of ways to do it. Do you suppose that God can find all sorts of ways to get our attention? We are studying this Bible character named Jonah. Last week we saw some indicators that Jonah needed revival. And as you study throughout the book of Jonah... Jonah is the only character in the book of Jonah that needed revival. You say, what about all those Ninevites? They needed salvation. That is evangelism. That's what they needed. Jonah, a prophet of God, a child of God, he is somebody that desperately needed revival. And in his life, in the story that we saw last week, Jonah proved the indicators in his life demonstrated that he desperately needed revival. And we might find those same indicators in our life. Now, to be honest with you, I think that those indicators were already in Jonah's life, but like us, he'd squashed them down. He had pushed them deep into his soul, and he didn't really realize how desperately he needed revival. But when God commissioned him, and Jonah decided to do exactly opposite of what God had told him to do, and he hops a ship going to Tarshish, and the Bible says uh, that It's going the opposite direction of where God had called him. The uh, archaeologists say that at that time, that was the utter ends of the known world. That's how far he tried to escape God. He is running from God. He gives an indicator that he needs revival. And even at the end, we saw that he's sound asleep while the storm is is going on outside. And these old experienced sea dogs, they're scared to death. He's sound asleep. That does not mean that you have a clear conscience just because you get a good night of sleep. This man, he needed revival desperately. Is God just going to let Jonah slide? Or is God going to do some things to get his attention? Let's make a quick application to our life. We need revival. Is God just going to let it slide in your life and mine? No. 
God is going to do what it takes to get our attention. And as we look at this this morning, just a couple of main points, but we'll fill those in. First of all, how would God go about doing this? If God wants to get our attention, how would God go about doing it? The book of Jonah, chapter 1, keep your marker here, verse 4, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Some of the methods that God might use to get our attention starts out with this, God might send a storm. God might send a storm. In the Hebrew, the words mean literally that the Lord hurled an intensely loud and massive wind. That's what the Hebrew translates to what it says here, that God sent out a great wind into the sea. That almost in the English sounds too calm. The Bible says God hurled it. He hurled this intensely loud, massive wind on these sailors on this ship, all because of Jonah. Go with me, if you will, to the book of Job, chapter 37. Job 37 is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. As you read Job chapter 37, we're going to take time and we're going to read the first 12 verses, and we are going to see how the nature itself can be used by God. It says here in Job 37, at this also my heart trembleth and is moved out of his place. Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directeth it under the whole heaven, and his lightning unto the ends of the earth. After it, a voice roareth. He thundereth with the voice of his excellency. He will not stay them when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he, which we cannot comprehend. For he saith to the snow, Be thou on the earth, likewise to the small rain, and to the great rain of his strength. He sealeth up the hand of every man, that all men may know his work. And then the beasts go into dens and remain in their places. Out of the south cometh the whirlwind, cold out of the north. By the breath of God frost is given, and the breadth of the waters is straightened. Also by watering he wearieth the thick cloud, he scattereth his bright cloud. And it is turned round about by his counsels, that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the world in the earth. As you read those things, it's a description of weather weather patterns. You know, when when you hear it thundering, the scientists will tell you that how the, the ions and the lightning and the this and the that and all that kind of stuff is going on out there in the atmosphere. And that may be true. You know, scientifically speaking, that may be true. But what you're hearing is the voice of God. God thundereth. You're hearing his voice, the lightning, these other things that we see that, it, oh, it's just nature, you know, this is the way nature is working, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but what you're hearing is God. Why does he talk through nature? Well, because everybody's going to experience it, right? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you are as far as animals go. They're experiencing it as well. Why does he bring these things about? Verse 13, he causeth it to come, whether for correction or for his land, or for mercy. Three reasons why those weather patterns will come. One of those three reasons is taking place when that weather is coming. In August of 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. It caused $125 billion in damages. 1,800 lives were taken when Katrina came in. In a speech that was given in October in Virginia, Franklin Graham suggested that God had brought this storm to a wicked place like New Orleans. He stated that they, the Christians in that area, believe that this storm is going to bring in God's revival. How do you suppose the media responded to that? How do you suppose even a lot of Christians and churches responded to that? He got ripped to shreds for making that statement. I'm sorry, but I agree with his statement. I'm not saying that that that's necessarily 100% why God brought it, because I don't know the mind and the hand of God, but I do know that God brought it. And I do know that God is trying to speak through those things. And God is trying to speak through the storms in life that we go through even now. Hurricanes in New Orleans, fires raging across California. Tsunamis and volcanic eruptions in Hawaii, 
floods and droughts across the Midwest. And now, what they call that snowstorm, Hurricane Malcolm, I think it was, that came from the north and, and just kind of buried the Midwest? Or what about 9-11 in New York City? What about the riots in D.C.? What about COVID all across the world? Storms of any sort. You suppose God's using those to serve His purposes? Somebody has wisely said this, sometimes God has to shake us to wake us. Sometimes God has to shake us to wake us. And folks, the church has been so asleep in the United States of America for so long. And when a person is deeply sound in sleep, they have to be shaken. And sometimes have to be shaken very violently. If you're a sound sleeper and somebody's trying to wake you, uh, especially for parents with your kids, have you ever had a child that you could have dumped the bucket of ice, you could have thrown them on the floor, and all they would have done is just rolled over with the cover and went right back to sleep? What a picture of the church today. God has gone through all these different things to shake us, the storms of life, and we are not waking up yet. So how else might the Lord get our attention? Go back to Jonah chapter 1, verse 5. The Bible says in verse 5, Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship unto the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. The second way God might try to get our attention is by touching somebody that's near us. Touching somebody that's near us. We ended last week talking about our indifference to sin, and Jonah definitely is indifferent to his sin. The mariners, what have the mariners done? Absolutely nothing. I mean, they don't know why he's on board their ship. They took on a passenger. They're out to make money. He paid the fare. They have cargo. They're traveling. They are doing what they normally did. And yet God had to touch somebody else to get Jonah's attention. Does God ever use that means of touching somebody else to get our attention? In the book of Exodus, the Egyptian pharaoh has the children in captivity, children of Israel in captivity. When you read through the things that were happening in that passage of Scripture, you know that the children of Israel, they were under heavy taskmasters. The burden that was on them was great. They were being treated very cruelly by this pharaoh. God gave Moses a mission. Moses' mission was to go to the Pharaoh, and nine times the Pharaoh was told, let my people go. And then we know about the plagues, and if you will, turn to the book of Exodus chapter 12. Nine plagues out of the ten, they come and go. And I mean, some of those plagues were just absolutely wild, you know, the, the frogs, and when he had the opportunity to be uh, set free of those frogs, what does he say? He says, tomorrow, make them go away. And there's the kid's song, One More Night with the Stinking Frogs. One more night in sin. Why in the world would the Pharaoh have done this? You see, the frogs were a nuisance. The, the water turned to blood. It was a nuisance. It was gross, but it was a nuisance. And it didn't get his attention So God is going to touch somebody near the Pharaoh to get his attention. In Exodus 12, verse 29, it came to pass that at midnight, the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn in the cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord, as you have said. It ought to frighten us to think that God can touch somebody near us. Close in proximity, close in relationship. If we are unwilling to do what God has told us to do, folks, God can touch somebody near us. 
And the way to get our attention oftentimes is it'll be somebody dear to us. Does God have to do that? How many parents have gotten in the way of their children when the children have wanted to serve the Lord and give their lives to the Lord, but the parent got into the way because they didn't want their child to, to be under such a burden. They didn't want their child to go to such a, an ungodly nation to go so far away from them. They didn't want to be separated. And so they wanted to keep their child home and close and making a great fortune and all that kind of stuff. And God has had to touch somebody near and dear to get their attention. Folks, that is a dangerous, dangerous place to put us into. Why would we do that to ourselves? Here's something else. Go back to Jonah. Maybe God will send a storm. Maybe God will touch somebody near and dear to us. The third thing is maybe God will send somebody to expose our sin. Maybe God will send somebody to expose the sin. In verses 6 and 7, so the shipmaster came to Jonah and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Every one to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Do you see Jonah's rebellion? Jonah, they shouldn't have had to cast lots. Jonah said, it's me. I'm the problem. No. Jonah, in the back of his mind, is hoping that something's going to go wrong and he's not going to get found out. He is still trying to hide his sin. And God uses the casting of the lots for his sin to be exposed. God will expose our sin. You see, Christians, we have the privilege, we have the opportunity to expose ourselves. We have the opportunity to fess up, to claim it, that we did this, and to confess it before Almighty God. But oftentimes we don't do that, do we? Let's hide it. Let's pretend it'll nobody will ever find out. Let's make it go away. And it may take days, weeks, months, years, decades, but it's going to come out. Somehow God's going to expose it. Turn with me in your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. You might have an idea of the story we're getting ready to look at here. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. And it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. There came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take his own, of his own flock, and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You demand... Okay, that's not KJV English. Thou art the man. You demand, David. Wow. Try to be the fly on the wall watching this happen. This story that Nathan wove, it got David's anger stirred. David is righteously indignant that somebody would do such a thing. And Nathan says, you're the one that did it. It's amazing how we get righteously indignant about somebody else's sin, and yet we're doing the exact same thing. And God says, I can send somebody to expose you if that's necessary. God sent Pharaoh to expose Abraham, lying that Sarai was his sister and not his wife. God used Joshua 
to expose the sin of Achan. God used Haman, or excuse me, Mordecai, to expose Haman. God sent Paul to confront Peter about his hypocrisy. God sent an angel and even used a talking donkey to expose Balaam's sin. Do we not think that God can send anything to expose us? I think one of the things that we are seeing that is exposing our sin, Christians, have you ever thought that God sends us leaders to expose our sin? God sends us the leaders, sends a nation the leaders that they want, the leaders that they need, or the leaders that they deserve. And the church has been so sound asleep. And I think this past year and these coming years are going to not only paddle the Christian, but they're also going to purge the church. It's going to paddle the Christians. Christians, I say this for myself as well, we need a good spanking. We have had great opportunity. We look in our past church history in the United States of America, and there was a time where the church was on fire. There was a time where churches were experiencing revival. There was a time where the preaching in the pulpits was hot. And there was a time when the altars were full. And that day is gone. The church is the ones that have let it go to the side. And if God will use a talking donkey to get people's attention, God will use the leaders of a nation to get the attention of God's people. We have allowed this past year to obliterate the church. The things that have happened, people are still living in a fear. And churches have been decimated. You know what happens? We get out of doing good things. We get out of doing right things. We get lazy. And we get complacent. And God says... I can, send, I can send the leaders that you need. I can send somebody else to expose your sin. It's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call. I think we are seeing all across this nation of ours, and, and maybe even throughout the world, but we don't get to see a whole lot of what's going on in the world, but we do get to see what's going on in this country. And what I think that we are seeing right now is the purging of God's church. We're seeing that happen. When you have a strong wind that comes through and it shakes the trees. When the storm is over, what's left on the ground? The dead branches. And I think that the storm is exposing our sin. And it's shaking the trees. And a lot of dead branches are falling out. I really think that's what's happening. You can disagree with it, you can explain it away or whatever, but if you do try to explain it away, then explain to me what is happening. Explain to me why we see happening in our nation what we see happening. It's not the fault of the government. It's not the fault of Hollywood. It's not the fault of the uh, athletes. It's not the fault of the elites. It's the fault of the church. We've got to put the responsibility where it belongs. We need revival. Let's go back to Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Maybe, maybe the Lord's going to have to touch us physically. Verse 17, the Bible says that the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, how did Jonah get there? How did Jonah, I mean, Jonah just, uh, he agreed to just jump overboard, right? No. The Bible says they took up Jonah and cast him into the sea. We'll come back to that in just a minute. But the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Chapter 2, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I. And thou heardst my voice. Does that sound like Jonah is afflicted and and has been touched physically? 
we wonder, we speculate, what might Jonah have experienced in a fish's belly? Has anybody ever experienced it? Can come back and give us a story of what it would be like to be swallowed by a fish? In February of 1891, the Star of the East was whale hunting off the Falkland Islands of the South Atlantic. They were pursuing one of the largest sperm whale that they had ever found. One of the two boats had been capsized by this whale. The hunters went on to kill the whale, but two of their men had drowned. A fellow by the name of James Bartley was one of the missing fishermen. The crew mourned their loss, but they still had a task to do as they prepared this this gigantic (laughs) sea monster. They worked until midnight, removing blubber from the 80-foot-long, 80-ton fish. The next morning, they hoisted the whale's stomach on deck. To their surprise, the stomach was moving. When the stomach was cut open, Bartley was found unconscious. They bathed him. They placed him in the captain's quarters for two weeks. He was confused and mentally disturbed. (laughs) I bet he was. Yet in four weeks, he had fully recovered and was able to recount his experience, and for the rest of his life, he carried the scars of a bleached white face, neck, and hands from the whale's gastric acid. A fellow by the name of DeParvel, he is the science editor of a scientific journal that I cannot pronounce, he investigated the incident and verified that Bartley was indeed the reason for the movement. That was not a hoax, that was real. What did Jonah look like? After three days and three nights getting hacked up on the sea, or on the shore, I mean, what did he look like? He carries the scars with him for the rest of his life. Would God touch any of us physically to get our attention? Let's go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 32. I would imagine Jonah kept the marks on his body of having been in that whale's belly for the rest of his life. In Genesis 32... We have another Bible character that God touched physically. Genesis 32, verse 24, Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. Verse 32, therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which is shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. I believe Jacob limped the rest of his life. He carried with him the mark, the physical mark of having been touched by God. What about Paul? Paul has this infirmity in the flesh. The Bible says he prayed three times for it to be removed. This messenger of Satan. Why does the Bible tell us that he had this infirmity of the flesh. The Bible says, lest I be exalted above measure. I think Paul had an issue with pride, and God knew how to keep him humble. He gave him this infirmity of the flesh. He allowed this to come upon him. He touched him physically. If God wants to get our attention, do you not think that God can touch us physically? Now I ask as we look at these things this morning, What is it going to take for God to get our attention? What is it going to take? Our God has the right to do anything He wants, and He can do anything He wants to get our attention. What's it going to take? Why do we want to push Him to the point that He has to do something? The second question. Not only what would God do, why would God do these things to get our attention? That's the second major point. Why? Go back to Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verse 8. The lot has been cast, it fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. And then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, What hast thou done? 
For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Why would God do these things to get our attention? First of all, to get us to confess our sin. To get us to confess our sin. Proverbs says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we will confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God wants us to confess our sin. As I said at the beginning in this book, Jonah is the only one capable of revival. But Jonah is un- incapable of revival so long as there is unconfessed sin. And Christian, you, are, you and I are incapable of having revival so long as there is unconfessed sin. So long as we're continuing to run from God. So again, I ask, what will it take for God to get your attention, to get my attention, to get the attention of our nation so that we might confess our sin? When you look at presidents from years past, starting right from Washington, and the times where they called for national days of fasting and repentance, When was the last time that we heard a president call for a national time of repentance and admitting that we are a nation that has strayed so far from God and we are in need of His divine intervention? When was the last time that we really heard that talked about? It's been a while. We need to confess our sin. But just because we confess our sin, the second thing is this. Why does God do all this? to prepare us for the consequences, to prepare us for the consequences. Back to Jonah verse, chapter 1, verse 11. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may become unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea become unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it has pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. To prepare us for the consequences. Here's a thought. Why didn't they turn the boat around? I mean, Jonah has confessed his sin. Why didn't they turn the boat around? There's a real simple answer for that. Had they turned it around and the storm stopped and Jonah's still on board and they got closer and closer back to the place where Jonah had turned his back on the Lord, how easy would it have been said, you know, guys, change my mind. Turn her around again. Let's get back on course. You see, when we confess our sin, our sin has to be dealt with. It has to be dealt with completely. With Jonah cast into the sea, no turning back, no turning back. (laughs) There is no way to undo that. Consequences. We can confess our sin and be forgiven of our sin, but that does not make consequences disappear. Consequences, Christian, even come in our life. If we don't want the consequences, then we ought not to sin, right? What's the old saying? Don't do the, if you don't want to do the time, don't do the crime. Okay. Well, if we don't want the consequences, then don't sin. It's very simple. If we don't want to be tossed overboard and have to be dealt with in a severe manner, then just don't sin. It's that simple. But here's one more. Verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. The third reason why God would do all this is to get our, to get our attention is to be a witness to the world. To be a witness to the world. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible tells us that the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of the Lord. And if it happens to us, what about them? It has to begin here. It is a witness to the world. Many commentators believe that these old crusty pagan sailors 
actually became believers at this point. Spurgeon preached a four-point sermon on this. Here's his points. He said, sinners, when they are tossed upon the sea of conviction, make desperate efforts to save themselves. Second point, the fleshly efforts of awakened sinners must inevitably fail. They tried to keep the ship upright. They tried in their own effort. The third point, the soul's sorrow will continue to increase as long as it relies on its own efforts. The fourth point, the way of safety for sinners is to be found in the sacrifice of another on their behalf. Jonah was sacrificed on their behalf. He had sin. Jesus Christ was sacrificed on our behalf because he had our sin. Not his sin. He was sacrificed for our sin. Whether the sailors actually became believers or not, I don't know. I hope Spurgeon was right. Regardless, his points are right. His points are 100% right. What will it take for God to get our attention? Truthfully, this is frightening to think about. And I've heard different people talking about what's going on in our world today. And they have used the word. It is frightening. Yes, it is. If you can sit here and, and read the news and stuff like that and say, oh, that's not frightening at all. you got a problem. It is frightening. But as a child of God, we understand God has a plan. God has a purpose. And we're called to trust Him. And we have to realize that part of God's purpose has got to be to wake His church up. Christians, is God waking any of us up this morning? Is God doing anything in our heart and our life? Are we going to push God to the extreme to where He has to deal very harshly with us to get our attention? Or are we going to surrender and bow our knee before Him now? If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can be going along in life right now and thinking everything's going great for you. No problems. You're not worried about anything. Oh, this is all great. This is all wonderful what's going on, yada, yada, yada. And for you, temporarily, this may be all well and good. But the day is coming. Our life is but a vapor. And your day ends without Jesus Christ as Savior. Regardless of what the Christian goes through this side of eternity, what awaits us is wonderful and glorious and just cannot begin to describe it. But you without Jesus Christ as Savior, what awaits you is hell. What awaits you is eternal torment. What awaits you is God's judgment. What awaits you is a condemnation that you will never, ever, for all of eternity, be able to get out from under. That's what awaits you without Jesus Christ as your Savior. Being tossed into a sea that is tempestuous, being swallowed by a whale, that is nothing compared to an eternity of hell. And today, lost soul, Jesus Christ wants to save you. He was the one that hung on the cross with your sins because of you, dying and shedding His blood for you and are rising from the grave with the power to give new life to all who would believe. Would today, lost soul, be the day that you would come to Jesus and be born again? It's a decision you dare not put off now, today. Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that you do love us so much. your children, that you won't let us stray too far. That you'll do what it takes to bring us back. And Father, I pray for that child of God here this morning, and I don't know who it is. You know who you're dealing with, and they know that they're being dealt with. But they are fighting so hard against you. We pray that this, that this would be the day that they would get things right with you that the unconfessed sin would pour out to you, that the things that are keeping revival from their heart would spill out of their mouth in confession to you, that they would get things right. We pray, Lord, for that, that lost soul here this morning. They need to be saved today. They need to turn their eyes upon you. 
and turn away from the things that are in this world. Turn away from the things that they've been trusting to be right with you. May this be the day of salvation for that soul, we pray in Jesus' name.